Hey indie filmmakers, he's Griffin Hammond. And he's Nick Bodmer. On this week's episode, they're sharing their tips for recording great voiceover tracks. Plus, your questions about exposure blending, what to do when your video content is stolen, and if it's legal to film in a national park. Hey, Nick. Griffin, we've been shanghai What <laughs> just happened? That was my good friend Matt Shivers. He's a voiceover artist, and he took over our intro this week. Well, that was interesting. Wasn't <laughs> expecting that. Yeah. Well, I wanted to talk about voiceover this week, and I thought that uh, getting him involved would be good. So we have several tips today from Matt, and we'll talk about our own tips for recording good audio. Sounds good. And and one thing I want to say off the bat is I think a good reason to do an episode about this is I feel kind of bad about our audio last week. Ooh, it was rough. It was rough. <laughs> yeah. That's what happens when you don't properly monitor your audio before you just start rolling with it. Yeah. Although, you know, even if I had been monitoring a little bit, I'm not sure I would have noticed it. Yeah, it, it's hard to pick up until you got headphones on. And uh, Although you said you weren't even noticing it in Final Cut until you exported, right? Yeah, it was a weird thing. So here was what the problem was, uh, and I think the the solution would have been pretty easy, was we had two microphones, two shotgun yep. microphones, very close to each other, mm -hmm. pointed at each of us. We were sitting pretty close together in Utah last week. And in when I exported the, the final video, you can hear this, what would you call it? Is it like... I'd call, I would call it a phasing issue. This is a real mystery. He wouldn't let me see anything. <laughs> so... Here's a picture that I took with the camera. It's like an echo, but it's so tight that it's it's like barely an echo. Uh, and what's weird is that it didn't happen in Final Cut. Like when I was playing it back, it sounded normal. Yeah, that's I don't understand that part of it. To me, the phasing should be present all the time. Like on a soundboard, this is an issue that can happen when you have two mics too close to each other. There's a button you can put on a specific channel to, you know, invert the phasing, which should help right. make, you know, it basically offsets it by, I guess, 90 degrees. I, I don't remember what. Yeah. But uh, it's supposed to make that kind of thing go away. Yeah. Um, it's like our delay was so short, but there was a delay that it causes this. It kind of sounds weird. And now the, the other know, solution Final Cut was like solving it somehow in real time, like for me, like that's what was weird is that it wasn't playing it for me. And then when I exported it, I heard it immediately. I was like, oh, this isn't good. Yeah, I do not understand why that happened. So uh, I'm going to look to the audience. My guess is somebody's going to be able to tell us why that was. So yeah, and I went at so you, audience. A after that problem happened, I thought, well, I can go back into Final Cut and I can just adjust our timing a little bit. But as soon as I did it, realized it, I can't push it in either direction because it's just going to make you worse or me worse. Like now, could you have? I mean, this would have been a pain and maybe too much work, but just cut each audio track when each of us was speaking so there's only one audio track and they weren't overlapping yes i mean the easy post fix would have just been actually turning down each channel when we're not talking but i've done that before i think i actually we may have had this problem on our first episode we recorded in person oh. together with two microphones pretty close to each other and i did go through one by one and every time we talked one channel the volume goes up the other one goes down then you talk, it, and then it goes up, it, it goes down. It can't be that hard. You do like 90% of the talking. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be easy if we were like very scripted and back and forth and back and forth, but it's a conversation, so we're kind of in and out the whole time. And we talk over each other. Right. I was hoping to catch you there. <laughs> so yeah, it's not an easy fix, and I, I, it bothered me so much, but I was glad to know that I didn't see, I mean, I saw people noticing it in the comments. Uh, we got plenty of YouTube comments about it, but people weren't upset about it. People didn't stop listening because of it. So it wasn't. I was pretty upset, but you don't care <laughs> you about <were> me. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes when I encounter a problem like that, it's like, well, I could spend the hours to fix this, but it probably won't affect the audience too much. Yep. So, yeah. So hopefully we're better this time. Yeah. I am recording with a different mic than I normally record with. So who knows what that's going to do? Yeah, so you're actually in Chicago this week. I'm in Naperville, Illinois, suburb yeah. of Chicago, in my parents' basement, Ooh. which is exciting. <laughs> uh, so yeah, my travel setup uh, is a little lighter. This is a Shure SM58, uh, pretty standard stage vocal mic. Maybe yeah. not the best podcast voiceover mic, but... I don't know, know I imagine that's a, probably a, a great mic for this kind of thing. 
Yeah, yeah. It's got a nice little mid-tone lift for enunciation and things like that. So yeah. we'll see how it's it sounds. For, it's made for human voice. Last time I traveled uh, to Chicago, I tried to use my Rode and that little tiny DR08 audio recorder, and it turned out right. really bad, you'll recall. Oh, so yeah. I brought the full Zoom H4n and uh, and a proper mic this time. And you're using the same camera you usually use, the G85? G85. Yep. yep. Right there on a uh, Gorillapod on a stack of books to get it up higher. Yeah. So... I want to start with a question that we got from uh, Nate's film tutorials that kind of kicked off this the inspiration for this episode about voiceover. Okay. Uh, and I actually just had my friend Matt record the question. This comment comes from Nate's film tutorials. Here's a podcast idea. How to craft your narrating voice. I want my voiceovers to be coherent, but also not sound like I'm reading a script. That's a good question, Nate. I think the biggest point to make here is that there is no magic bullet there's a lot of practice and repetition and learning that goes along with voiceover. You are essentially acting. So you have to know what you want, and then you have to be able to practice that. That was excellent. Yeah. He knows what he's doing. Jeez. <laughs> and he sounded great the whole time answering. <laughs> Just such so, a pleasing voice. Yeah. Well, and if you like Matt Shivers' voice, we're going to hear uh, several tips from him today. Uh, but you can also check him out at shiversmedia.com. Cool. He he does lots of professional work. First of all, let's start by talking about what mics Matt actually uses. What does okay. he use to record his voice? Well, over? he has told us he uses a Newman TLM one hundred and three and a Sennheiser MKH four one six four sixteen. Um, which, I don't know anything uh, about either of those mics. Yeah, I looked them both up. Um, I've seen both of these in studios before. They're pretty. Uh, pretty common the newman is a uh, kind of a what you'd expect on a boom arm in a studio condenser mic looking thing um with just great for narration and voiceover and then the the sennheiser is actually a short shotgun mic um okay. also designed for voiceover work but a little more rugged um good for use outdoors uh so if you're kind of on the go or on location i think that sennheiser is is well well received for that kind of thing and i know that matt used to use a behringer b2 pro that's actually okay. the mic that he had or he let me borrow back when i did the voiceover for sriracha nice and i, I really like the sound of that mic and it's, sure. it's not too expensive i think it's like in the 150 range okay well these two are a little more the the newman's uh, 1100 and the sennheiser is a thousand yeah i mean that's so. what i would expect from someone who has who is getting commercial work and yeah, buying better when, mics. When you're getting paid, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. But I will say, I still use a trick today that I used to use, like, way back when we had, like, Sony Handycams. I think I know what it is. <laughs> what is it? Is it the closet trick? Well, that's what I do now a lot of times is going into the closet. But because just because there's there's clothing everywhere and it's a way to get a really dead sound. But before I even realized I could do that, I would go to another place that I could find a pretty dead sound, which was inside a car. Oh, okay. I used to actually just take, remember, we used to have like a little cheap $20 Radio Shack lav mic. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the only mic I even had that could plug into a camera. So plug that into my handy cam. I would take that out to the car and I would just sit in the car because there's like upholstered seats and that kind of absorbs some of the, the reverb. And I would just sit in the car where it's quiet. It's already kind of like soundproof in there and uh, record voiceover that way. It's a genius. <laughs> and that's, I've, I still do that re as recently as last year when I was on the campaign trail. Occasionally, this is what would happen to me all the time. I'd be editing a video, get the video done at like 3 a.m. And it's time for me to finally record my voiceover. And I'm in a hotel and I could start yelling in my hotel room. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, um, the the neighbors next door might not like that so much. Right, yeah. So I'd go out to the parking lot and sit in the car and do the voiceover in the middle of the night. All right, what other tips do we have? Well, let's see. So Matt has five tips for us. Uh, let's start with his first one, uh, which is how to warm up. Warm-ups. Are you getting limber before running a 5K, or are you hitting the street right away? Not so fast, Jack Lalane. Doing vocal warm-up exercises will get your voice ready to perform. A quick Google search reveals plenty of them. 
Tongue twisters are good too. Swiss wristwatch. Try saying that one out loud a couple times. Swiss... I already screwed it up. <laughs> you know you need unique New York. That's a good one. <laughs> you know, I actually never do vo vocal warm-ups. Maybe I should. Uh, yeah, I don't either, but I don't do much voiceover, so I'm not <laughs> the guy you want to take advice from. I do warm up before this podcast. I guess we talk to each other for a few minutes before we get started. Yeah. Is I a podcast say, voiceover work? What would you say? Yeah, I mean, we're we're doing voiceover right now. Um, Just unscripted. Yeah. And and I think uh, our, our tone on this podcast could, could transfer to voiceover pretty well. I think I find that generally I have to, like, get myself in the right headspace for voiceover, and I have to be louder than I think I'll be, that I need to be. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because if you're not loud enough, it'll come across as, like uninterested all right i'm just gonna whisper into my mic from now on <laughs> do i sound interested or not i mean you can always raise up someone's volume you know we always put a compressor on vocals to yep. to kind of get those quiet whispery parts to come up but it's not going to change the tone of it the emotion of it right and i i definitely have pieces where i thought i was recording a great voiceover I even thought I was being loud, but the problem is I was in a quiet hotel room at 3 a.m. and I was talking into a curtain because I wanted to eliminate reverb and just didn't realize that I was being really quiet because I was yeah. probably self-conscious about my volume. And you screwed it up. So sometimes I like to think about like I'm talking to someone across a room. Like you kind of need that level of volume to, to have decent recordings. I wonder if I'm being too quiet right now. <laughs> You're in a quiet room. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I don't know. I think on the podcast it works because we're hearing each other in each other's ears and we're reacting. It's different when you're by yourself. You're not as loud, I don't think. Yeah, makes sense. Know the script. Are you familiar with the script? Is it well written? Chances are you can only control one of those two factors, so get familiar. Being able to cold read a script is great, but it's not the only skill to rely on when you're settling in to record. Practice it. Make it a part of your warm-up. While you're practicing, now is a great opportunity to look for any hard-to-pronounce or unfamiliar words. Don't be afraid to ask for phonetic spelling. Getting it right the first time equals time savings and happy clients. Nick, what's a word you always screw up? I never make a mistake. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> what word I, do I always screw up? I don't know. I, I, you're oh, pretty I thought good. you had. I thought you had one. <laughs> no. Sometimes you screw up names. Yeah. But that's that's good advice from Matt about. I think, I find that even if I write the script myself, and I'm the one that's going to record it, you you know you would think it's all going to work perfectly, but if I just do a quick read through, even if I'm not trying to do the voiceover, just do a quick read through audibly. I'll find like tongue twisters in there that I didn't think, you know, they didn't feel weird in text. Right. But you're like, oh, no, actually, that sounds terrible as voice. So I usually make a few edits because, like, this is going to be voice, not written. But he makes an interesting point there that for some of, I'm guessing, his commercial work, rewriting is not an option. Right. <laughs> yeah. You simply you just, just <laughs> have to figure out how to do it. Yeah. Uh, I wish I had practiced and known my script better when I did that hard drive video and I kind of read off of a. A screen and it was pretty obvious when I was on camera I think yeah. if I had uh, taken this advice and and rehearsed it a little bit it would have been better yeah yeah I mean writing in pauses is okay and can help help the flow of it and yeah I, I do find I'm often checking sp like pronunciation of, of especially last names like you'll write a whole script and then you'll be like oh geez I just did a whole documentary about a person and I'm not even entirely certain how to pronounce their last name <laughs> Oops. <laughs> I think for, for hand cut, I called up Paul Mignaldi. His name is M-A-G, let's see, M-A-G-N-A-L-D-I. It's Italian. Magnali. Yeah, it could be Magnaldi. <laughs> so I think I called him up. I think I, I figured out it was probably Mignaldi, and I called How him up to say. How did you even get there? Well, just, I think that's a, that's a normal Italian pronunciation. Interesting. You're smarter it's like, than it's I. It's like lasagna, like the 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 G N ah. goes together. Yeah, uh, Magnaldi. So 
but I called up. Uh, I actually didn't even talk to him. I called up uh, like the person who answered the phone was his assistant. I just said, "Hey, does Paul pronounce his name Paul Mignaldi?" And he was kind of like, "Yeah, Mignaldi, Magnaldi, whatever." <laughs> <laughs> but it was just good to get some verification that I wasn't crazy. Well, you're crazy, but for other reasons. <laughs> Next chip. Your recording environment. Ready to record? Stop. Close your eyes and listen. What do you hear? A fan? A fridge? An air conditioner? If you hear it, so will your mic. And unless you have some high-end noise cancellation plugins at your disposal, it's going to wind up in the mix. Mitigate the noise up front. Can you hear anything right now, Nick? Uh, yeah, as soon as he said that, <laughs> there is a very loud clock right behind my camera. <laughs> so... <laughs> We're just going to keep rolling with that because I don't think I can take it down right now. Well, it's just ticking away? It's ticking, and it's it's pretty loud. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ticking is uh, not the, something you The entire you can... audience is like, yeah, we've been hearing that <laughs> for about 20 minutes already. Thanks. <laughs> and ticking is not something you can really get rid of with noise reduction. Just every tick, go ahead and edit it, get in there and edit it out. <laughs> well, at least can we know exactly that? where they're going to fall. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, sometimes like uh, our, our last episode, we we started to record. I mean, this was the the least of our audio issues on that episode, but we started to record, and a sprinkler started going off as soon as we started recording. It wasn't there yeah. when we were setting up, uh, but it it didn't bother me too much because it was in the distance, and it was a pretty consistent sound. So I kind of thought, yeah, kind of white noise like, right? Yeah, we could probably remove it as noise reduction. And, and in the end, it turned out it wasn't even very audible. I think we were kind yeah. of blocking the mics. So. Just just like this clock. Nobody can yeah. hear it. <laughs> I did, like, turn off a fan before I started recording. Uh, sometimes I go, like, make sure my dryer's not going. Um, but, yeah, my AC usually gets turned off. In fact, I, I'm a little bit sweaty right now as we record. Yep, you're gross. <laughs> Mouth clicks. Are you hearing a weird clicking sound when you record your voiceover? Is it costing you precious editing time? Staying hydrated is one way to avoid that. You might also chew a small piece of sugarless gum for a few minutes before cracking the mic. Now you that heard... is a pro. Yeah, I have that like crazy. So sugarless gum. I did not know that trick. I yeah. should do that. Well, and I, I've always heard that you could eat like a green apple. Have you heard this hmm. tip? I think you gave me that tip, but I didn't understand that the green apple was important. I was chomping away at a pink lady, and <laughs> I don't think it helped. Well, so, yeah, I asked him Matt about it. I was like, well, yeah, what's the deal with this apple thing? And he said, yeah, it does have to be a green apple, and it also is kind of a limited effect. Like, I think it may just be for a few minutes. And is it, it because helps. it's tart, and so, like, it reduces your salivary glands? I don't even understand why. I'm not what, sure. What, but yeah, he what said, does what? But. He said, you know, that's a quick fix, but the better fix is just... If you're well hydrated, you won't have that that lip smacking problem. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, I guess for like normal stuff, like a podcast, it's probably not too crazy. I guess if we were doing it all the time, it'd be really annoying. But I could see why for like professional, commercial kind of work, uh, you'd want to get rid of that. Yep. All right. Let's see. This is our final tip from Matt. Training and coaching. You've done it. You've recorded your voiceover. You pronounced everything correctly. It's clean audio, but it's missing something. That extra polish, that pro sound. You need training. And there's nothing wrong with that. Continuous education is important in many fields, and voiceover is definitely one of them. There's all kinds of training and coaching opportunities online, including different coaches for different voiceover styles. Narration, commercial, promo, and a lot more. But remember, it's an investment. So do your homework. Read reviews. Talk to other voiceover people. The VO community is incredibly generous with advice, and they've all been where you are. Well, thank you, Matt Shivers, for some great voiceover advice today. Yeah, how cool is that? And he again, sounds if you, very professional. Yeah, he knows what he's doing. And if you do need Matt for a project, I do occasionally use him for my projects. Uh, you should check him out at shiversmedia.com. He's a good guy, too. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate it. See how I enunciated that so well. <laughs> so, do we have any Matt other out of business? Do we have any other sound advice, narrating advice for our listeners and our viewers? Uh, squeaky chair. 
I got a squeaky chair here. That's <laughs> really that. annoying. <laughs> Avoid the squeaky chair. Um, I mean, you know this probably better than anyone. I'm a fidgeter. I have when I'm sitting recording, I like hit the desk and I hit the mic and I hit the mic cable and it's not good. But that's yeah, might and those just things be my own. Those things are easy to edit problems. out when they don't overlap with what you're saying, but when they're they often do. <laughs> yeah, they're not always easy to get rid of. I do find like consistent noise is easy to get rid of if you just have, uh, you know, if you if you recorded some noise and then there's a little bit of noise underneath your track, you could take it into Adobe Audition and get rid of it. But obviously, getting the cleanest uh, audio recording you can, the better. So find a quiet environment. Roger that. And I think just just like all audio recording, be close to the mic. You know, you want a high signal to noise ratio, so be close, be loud, in whatever environment you're recording in. And then the only other thing we do is we add like a compressor filter to our audio tracks. But sure. uh, I'm not doing any like crazy EQing or anything. Not when we sound so dang good. <laughs> I think people do like our voices. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why. <laughs> I mean, I get why they like my voice. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, you'll be I, shocked I, to know. Oh, go ahead. I almost no, I think, I, think you're, I think you're heading in the direction that I wanted to go. <laughs> well, so, last week we had a design national park, and we went to the Doc Utah Film Festival, and you showed me your new toy, your uh, DJI Spark drone. Yeah. And guess what I bought as soon as I got home? <laughs> <laughs> the same exact thing. Did this... you did you get the spark and the fly more combo? Of course I did. <laughs> of course I did. I couldn't live without that controller, the remote, and the extra battery and the prop guards. Yeah. So you got the Needed. whole deal. I got the whole setup. For, for people that aren't familiar, the the spark is a relatively cheap drone. It's five hundred dollars. Uh, and then for two hundred extra dollars, you can get the fly more combo, which I think is a great deal. It's all the things you would want to. Yeah, yeah, use with it, your drone. it really kind of gives you a full setup. Yeah, and I had it. I got it on sale for six hundred and fifty bucks, and then they. I just saw it went on sale for five ninety nine. So you can oh, wow. you can get deals on them. Yeah, well, and you immediately solved a problem that I was confused about. I was pretty sure that my drone would not let me do tracking a person and shooting video and then immediately i see you doing this yeah yeah i'm not quite sure what your problem is there no uh, i think i know i think i figured it out i there is like an advanced setting you have to turn on or something well i think you were using a different tracking mode than i was trying to use i was trying to use like the the gesture control mode sure which you can like tell it to do certain things take a picture all this with with different controls and one of the commands is like follow me but it's that was a different mode, I think. Weren't you using like the yeah, I'm automatic using active tracking track? Mode? Active yeah. track, yeah. It's kind of cool. Yeah. You basically just draw a little box around on the frame of what you wanted to track, and then it it locks on and away it goes. It was pretty cool. Yeah. Maybe I, I can share that video of it uh, chasing me around a backyard. Yeah. <laughs> I'll send that to you. You probably didn't run into this limitation, but I learned that when you're in active track mode, it will only go a hundred meters from where it took off. Oh, I did not know that. But I, again, I was in the backyard, so it didn't. Yeah. Uh, that's probably good because if it like started tracking the wrong object, it just flew right. away. <laughs> That'd be funny. Although I could be wrong. It may be that it, it can it can travel with the remote. I don't know. I can't remember. Mm. But uh, it was very fun. I'm having a blast with it for sure. Yeah. I bet you're already I... better at it than me. Like you're you're much more tech savvy than me with that kind of thing. Uh, yes, I agree. <laughs> 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 I've been playing with the return to home mode that you seem to to be scared of when we were uh, up yeah. there in Utah. It seems to work great as long as you validate the you know that it has locked in a good return to home point before it takes off. Um, it seems to land within like a foot of where it took off from. It's oh, really yeah. cool. And are you using the uh, the Before You Fly app from the FAA? I have not been oh. using that app i forgot <laughs> that you showed me that but i remember yeah. now i mean yes every time i check that app thank you oh i should tell you i after i left you in uh when we de we parted ways in in nevada i headed to denver mm -hmm. actually i went to colorado springs to visit some family 
And I was excited to show my uncle my new drone, and he actually had actually just moved into a new house. And I was like, oh, I could show you what your house looks like from above. Uh, not even planning to go very high, but I, I, uh, I, I went into the app, and immediately it wouldn't, it just said, like, you can't fly. And you're like, what? Yeah, the DJI f- app was just like, can't fly here, just can't, won't even take off. And I was like, oh, this is weird. So I checked out the, the Before You Fly app. And sure enough, I was in the Air Force Academy no-fly zone. Oh, well, that's probably a good place to limit people's ability to fly. Right. Makes sense. Well, and I've encountered with the Spark, there are places where it doesn't want you to fly, but the app won't restrict you from flying. It's just saying, like, It just like, warns hey, you, like, hey, yeah, yeah. you're going to want to be careful here. Uh, but this was the first time I've ever seen the app just say, like, nope, <laughs> for national security, I'm not going to let you do this. Interesting. Yeah. Well, it's cool they can do that kind of thing, though. Yeah. No, it's good that they can they can block you. Like I knew they would probably do that. You know, if you're standing outside the Las Vegas airport, it surely it's not going to let you take off. Did you see these short uh, clips I shared earlier today of my dad mowing the lawn? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the greatest bit of filmmaking the world has ever seen. Yeah. God, it's it gave just so much pretty, fun, though. It's just you gave so it some much pretty fun. exciting music to go with. Uh, well, that was just dull Apple's, <laughs> Apple's default. <laughs> well, I don't know what to do because there's no sound in the video from the drones. Right. I was like, yeah, I, I feel like you have to put something down. So I just picked the default Apple Music track. Yeah, from Final Cut. I should get in the habit of like recording my Zoom H4n or my Zoom H5 along with flying drones. Yeah, just have some audio. You know, this is when you really would need an actual slate, right? No, yeah. no audio sync possible without something like that. I guess you just. Now, did you know that the the iPhone app will actually record audio from your flight? Oh, you know, you told me that, and I forgot all about it. I haven't really figured out how that works. Is it just I mean, a the setting first, somewhere? The first time I ever used it, it asked for permission to use my microphone. I know, but it doesn't seem to be recording any videos on my phone. Right, you have to like copy the videos off the drone onto the phone, and when that happens, the app seems to apply the audio. Oh. Although I kind of wish you could just like download the audio track straight from the phone, because I've done yeah. a weird workflow of like pulling these lower res video files off the phone, bringing them into Final Cut, syncing them with the better files straight off the SD card from the drone, just so Wait, I could it- have audio. What is, does it compress the video before it sends it to the iPhone? I you're saying you're I'm not confused. getting you're not getting I, the original quality video. That I don't know. I don't know if it's, it's not copying. Like the drone is going to convert the video. Is it? I can't remember if either the app is recording its own version simultaneously, uh, or if it's actually pulling the like it's the recording full the thing. feed f- from the from the. Yeah, I see. Yeah. Okay. Or for all I know, the drone makes a low res version to send over the phone. I don't know. I I found that that sending to the phone is quite slow. Yeah. Okay. So many unanswered questions. We're not. Uh, well, we're clearly we're not DJI play with these Spark things experts. A lot more, and we will. <laughs> I'm certain be talking about them more. Yeah. Well, let's uh, in a moment get to some questions that we actually do know the answers to. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So shortly, we're going to answer your questions about exposure blending, what to do when your video content is stolen and if it's legal to film in a national park. Hey Indie Filmmakers podcast is brought to you by Tongle. Tongle is a creative network where anyone, anywhere, has the opportunity to make content for brands and get paid. Nick, I'm gonna see if I remember from last week this this ad read. Okay. Tell me if I get this right. Tongle is asking for your contributions from our audience they are building out their YouTube channel and they're doing something called the YouTube Pilot Portal where you can submit videos, you can submit a whole series of videos. Any ideas that you have that could be interesting for a filmmaking audience, that's the kind of stuff they're looking for right now on their YouTube channel. So submit your ideas and if you get chosen, you, they might purchase your stuff and you can get paid uh, to make this stuff. I kind of te- yeah. I kind of messed it up at the end, uh, maybe. <laughs> I think you did great. I think you get an A+. Plus. That's oh, what I give you. you. <laughs> now, we did learn, though, that one of the voiceover tips is to read your material and learn it before you, <laughs> before you do it. So what do, you think, uh, what do you think you're doing? I just thought we did such a good job reading the ad last week. It was just dead on. You just wanted I'm... to lower the bar a little bit for I wanted for to future. mix it up this week. <laughs> <laughs> 
I think it is cool though that you know you just pitch an idea and you might get some money or they might produce your series or whatever. Yeah, I mean that's how the whole Tongle ecosystem works anyway. Uh, there's a lot of things you can pitch your ideas for. Uh, this just happens to be one brief that they're doing right now where the client. There's lots of different clients, lots of different brands. But in this case, the client is the website itself. It is actually. Tongle. Yeah. And you know where you can get the details. You can visit tongle.com slash projects. T-O-N-G-A-L dot com slash projects. Good job, Nick. It sounds like you've read that script before. <laughs> you, you did it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's start with an email from Alex, who is using the settings file that I have for the GH5. Yep. He downloaded my file. He switched it over to C1, the custom part of the dial, where I have a slow-mo preset. It goes right to 180 uh, frames per second. And he says that his shots are noisier. And he's wondering, is that normal? Is he exposing properly? Do you have any idea why this might be happening to him? Well, I'm guessing at 180 frames per second, obviously, that's a very short shutter speed. You're probably running at... um, 360, one 360th of a second yeah. uh, for the 180 degree roll, which is a very short shutter. So you're going to need a lot of light or a high ISO um, to in make fact, up I, that. In fact, I bet that's exactly where he's shooting because in my settings file, I'm pretty sure I have the like 180 degree rule turned on mm-hmm. where it's just automatically selecting a shutter speed that matches your frame rate. Yep. So yeah, he would be shooting at one three sixtieth of a second shutter, and that is really fast, and it is going to be dark. So find good light to shoot in. Yep, uh, high speed uh, slow mo definitely needs lots and lots of light. But you know what? I I think that maybe I should have changed my settings when I, I made this file. I'm not sure I agree that you should be shooting with the 180 degree rule when you're shooting 180 frames per second. And why is that? Because. I'm pretty sure, I, I remember reading uh, an article with Ang Lee about his film, uh, which one was it? It was He shot this film in like 120 frames per second. And I think he found it at shutter speeds that fast, at frame rates that fast, the shutter speed doesn't matter that much anymore. Like if you're delivering Because there's so frames, little motion already that yeah. the, well, it's the like, difference in blur is, is it, minimal. Yeah, it's like way past your persistence of vision. We've already convinced you that this is moving video because we're showing you 120 frames per second. There really doesn't need to be any blur between frames. So you can kind of use, I guess, like a 360 degree shutter where the shutter speed matches the frame rate. Well, let me let me go pull back and, and understand that better. I mean, the idea, though, this would be slowed down, right, to a 24 right. frames a second. Yeah, so you're right, yeah. Don't we still want some some... But I guess more blur might be acceptable when you're seeing something that's slow. I don't know. Yeah, I, guess I think it you're right. There, a little there's bit a, more on what you're shooting. Yeah, I think you're right. There's kind of a there's a there's a gray area there, and it's probably just up to your your subjectivity. I would play around with try shooting 180 at a shutter speed of 180 and see if you like the way it looks. If it looks too staccato, then yeah. Um, or no, that let's see, that'd be more blurry, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, the it's following the 180 degree rule with a one 360th. Uh, shutter speed is going to be less blurry. Right. Um, but if you drop that to a 300, this, these are the perfect numbers to be confusing. <laughs> if you drop that to a 360 degree rule of a shutter speed of one over 180, then you have more blur. Right. That so, yeah. wasn't confusing <laughs> at all. Yeah. <laughs> these fine tips brought to you by Hey Indie. Filmmakers. I think I think half our audience followed that just fine, and half our audience was like, "You just threw out way too many numbers and didn't really clear that up." <laughs> uh, in conclusion, try different things, see what you like. But yeah, I think yeah. In conclusion, you don't have to be stuck on that rule. Play around with what whatever you need to do for exposure, and, uh, and if see you if you can't like get more looks. light for what you're doing, I think feel free to to um, slow down that shutter speed and get some more light into the sensor, so you don't have all that noise. Alex also wants to know if there's an automatic mode on the camera for doing exposure. Uh, yes. Yeah. I mean, That's the quickest way is the intelligent auto mode. mode on the dial. Are you familiar with that? I know it's there. I actually don't. I, I don't know what makes it more intelligent than a regular auto mode. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, you can also, so you can either do that, just dial the whole camera into auto. That's going to do focus auto, ISO auto, white balance auto, all that. If all you want to do is auto exposure, you can go into the menu. I mean, I keep mine in manual exposure, but you can switch to A for aperture priority or S for shutter priority, and you can lock in your shutter or your aperture in those modes, and mm-hmm. it will it'll do the ISO and the other exposure thing. Yeah. It will not do ISO unless you set ISO to okay. auto ISO. You have to set, set that to auto. Yeah. And but actually, it, will, I, it, it just does the opposite. So if you're in aperture priority, it will choose your shutter. And if right. you're in shutter priority, it'll choose the aperture. So yeah, unless you do auto ISO, you're kind of limited in how far it can go Yep. Uh, exposure-wise. I actually didn't even know what P was. I realized program today mode. how ignorant I was. Yeah. But like program mode, I think I did know that it meant that. But that means nothing to me. What does program mode mean? <laughs> Yeah, it basically just, it, it lets, <laughs> it's choosing both, but it gives you a range of acceptable values you can cycle between, basically. So if you want it just to always make the right choices, <laughs> yeah. Um, but want to be able to spin that dial and maybe get, you know, a higher or lower shutter speed or a higher or lower aperture, it won't give you any incorrect choice, but it will uh, kind of adjust both through a range. Right. So yeah, so if you don't want to lock in, if you're not comfortable picking your shutter or your aperture and you would like the camera to do both those things, you put it into P exposure mode. Yeah. Yeah. Not a bad mode if you want to hand the camera to somebody to take a picture for you or something. Yeah. But you already set ISO and things like that. I usually just switch to intelligent auto, but like I would ruin my white balance that way and I would ruin my ISO and... My focus For me, might get off. I mean, when I'm shooting video nowadays, I'm almost always in manual. Um, sometimes, to, if I'm doing something where the lighting's changing a lot or I just can't miss the shot, I will use shutter priority and just set my shutter speed and let it pick the aperture. Um, and when I'm shooting photos, I often do the opposite, where I will put it in aperture priority and let it choose the shutter speed. Um, but mostly shooting manual these days. Yeah. So we got a YouTube comment from Mike Vrobel, who had a question about specifically a video that I shared last week. Last week, I showed you my uh, my video from Switzerland. Yeah, which was great, by the way. Thank you. I think I could say now that uh, I think now Panasonic has published this, that there are four videos coming out. These are four films that I made about uh, about different photographers. And... Ben Gruno, his his film uh, from Switzerland, his profile came out last week. This week, William Innes, who is a wedding photographer in California, his piece just came out. And uh, then I have two more coming out. I have uh, one about Jennifer Maring, who is a lifestyle photographer. We went to Italy together. And I also did a piece with Dan Cox in Alaska. So all these trips that I've been on the last couple months. Your secret trips. You wouldn't tell me what you were doing. Right. <laughs> this is them. I made some films. Got it. Got it. Well, that's cool. Yeah. So you but can back you to can Mike's watch, question. Right. Well, oh, you can go wa- ahead. You can watch Pro- promo yourself. You can watch these two. Uh, I'll put them in the show notes. Hey, dot film. But uh, Mike Robles' question was about something that Ben said in the last video. I do a little bit of exposure blending and I auto bracket everything in the camera. And he's just wondering, what does that mean? What does it mean? He I mean, says you know he understands what... auto bracketing. Yeah. Explain so bra- auto bracketing. Auto, you know what that auto is? Auto bracketing, you're taking pictures. You push the shutter one time. It's going to take between three and five pictures, I think, depending on settings and the camera. I don't know exactly what the GH5 does. But it takes them at a range of exposure. So it takes uh, an underexposed shot, a properly exposed shot, and an overly exposed shot um, in rapid succession. So then you basically have the same photograph uh, – dark, normal, and bright. And then um, maybe you can tell us what you how he does his exposure blending. But right. basically, it's a way of taking a, a scene that is greater than the dynamic range of the camera and being able to combine those images to compress that d- dynamic range down so that you can see everything uh, that was in the shot. Well, and it made a lot of sense, especially in this one circumstances where you see it in the film. He's taking a photo of foreground that's in the shade because the sun is going down. And the sun is still hitting the mountains in the distance. So that is a huge jump in in exposure range. We have something that's really overexposed in the distance, really underexposed in the foreground. And he would like to see all of it the way that our eyes do. Our eyes can see all of it. Yeah. Um, so he does do the, the auto bracketing, which is something I'm always jealous of as a videographer. I wish that somehow we could capture 
like three frames for every frame, like three exposures <laughs> for every frame. Um, and then, so Mike just wants to know how is he putting those together? And my understanding is that Ben actually just brings them into Photoshop and really just like feathers between these, just says, I want to. Stacks wanna... them up as layers and, and yeah. does some masking and, and brings them I mean, together. There's, there's several techniques you could use to, to blend things in Photoshop. There's also, I think in Lightroom and in Photoshop when dealing with multiple images, you can actually select several different exposures and say, like, combine these into one high dynamic range photo. So I guess it does it smart somehow. I don't, I don't know exactly what it does. So would you would you call this this technique HDR? It'd be one way to achieve HDR. I guess it'd be, it depends on if that's the look you want. And actually, I yeah. think, yeah, that's what Ben's doing. He's really creating a high dynamic range image. Yep. But I don't think he's going for that like that intense HDR look. He doesn't want it right. to look surreal. He wants it, he just wants it to look like reality. Yep. Um, so yeah, when he says he's he's doing exposure blending, that's just a manual process that he's going through. I also like Mike's little aside question here at the bottom. Is is Ben as close to a vertical drop to the valley below as he looks in some of those pictures, like in that time lapse you have with the fog? He does look like he's like about to fall off a mountain. Yeah, I mean, he's never as close as it looks. I mean, he is close to the edge, and he was definitely more comfortable being close to the edge than I was, by because he's he's. And moved. that was a drop right there. That was a drop, but I think if you really look over the edge, like if. I kept thinking, like, if I dropped here, I'd catch myself on the next ledge. <laughs> like, oh I'm not going to fall all the way down the mountain. <laughs> it wasn't as dangerous as it looked, but uh, he's, he's definitely comfortable on the mountains. Good for him. We got an email from Chris who wants to know, uh, you, Griffin, how did your relationship with Panasonic transpire? Did they reach out to you after watching Sriracha and seeing that you shot with GH3? They didn't reach out to me back then. Um Actually, it, my relationship with Panasonic is fairly recent. I mean, I've been using their cameras for a long time, but uh, it wasn't until I moved to New York and they were starting to think about their GH5 launch that they decided to bring me in. I think they'd been aware of me for a while, but it, this was the, the time when it was like, hey, we could actually use Griffin's help. Uh, but I was really happy because I, I kind of thought when I moved to New York, like, I use these cameras. I'd love to just have an in i'd love to like see the camera early you know and talk to them uh, So this was really exciting when they they brought me on cool all right so we have a, a first uh on the podcast nick i have a video question which cool sounds sounds weird to say it's actually we always have video questions this is a question that is not about video but it's on video Hey Griffin and Nick, my name is Titus and I love the podcast by the way. I have a quick question for you guys. I recently made a video review about a mattress and the company who makes the mattress saw it because they used clips of it in a recent Facebook ad campaign. So the only problem is they never told me they were doing this and this was a complete surprise. What can I do about this? I like the company so I don't want to rake them over the coals but I kind of feel like they might have crossed the line here. What do you guys think? That's a tough one, right? I mean, I think they crossed a line. Wouldn't you agree? Well, my my first thought was maybe they did use it in a fair use way. So okay. I explained to Titus what the tenets of fair use are. And one of the things is you are allowed to comment on on other works of art. It's kind of like um, like quoting an author in your paper that you're writing. As long as you put that quote in context and you give credit and you don't use very much of it, you just use enough to make your point, you're allowed to do that. And you can do that in a video way. So I kind of thought, you know, maybe this video starts off with a text on screen that says, hey, you should see what our fans are saying about us on YouTube. And maybe if they play 10 seconds of Titus's video, that wouldn't be so bad, right? Right. I mean... It would be pro probably legal. It'd have to go to court, and a judge would have to decide it. That'd probably be legal, but it's still not the best way to go about it. Like, they probably should have reached out to Titus and asked him. It's kind of weird to just take it. So what does he do here? Well, what's funny is he sent me the video, and I realized, no, they don't have a very strong fair use case at all. <laughs> <laughs> the video just begins with Titus on camera doing some of his things with the mattress and then it shows some other people who like the mattress and then it has the tight it has like the the tagline at the end of the video like there's no context there's no comment given i guess 
you could make the argument that they made a particularly transformative video and they didn't use too much of his content, but it's kind of a gray area. And I mean, they definitely would have made everyone happier if they just asked for permission. Yeah. I would just tell them to reach out to him and just say, hey, you know, what up? Yeah, See exactly. Say. Yeah, I mean, if you just let them know that it's, you know, you don't have to be mean about it. You can be polite, but just let them know that what they did wasn't necessarily appropriate, that you would have preferred that they asked you permission. And maybe there's some way to build a relationship off of that. Like, hey, I love your product. Uh, you know, I just wish you would have talked to me. Sure. I mean, you've been in a very similar situation. Yeah, I mean, this sort of thing has happened to me, and I've been able to use fair use arguments to kind of let people know that they weren't following the law, that they shouldn't have used my work the way they did. But generally, I'm not looking to take down stuff. Like, I, I showed Titus where on Facebook he could go to do a DMCA takedown. Yep. Like, he could tell Facebook, they infringed my rights. I want them to take this down, but it doesn't sound like that's what he wants to do. Uh, but I will put that link on on the show notes, hey.film, to where the DMCA takedown on, for Facebook is. So if anyone's ever, ever stealing, outright stealing your content, uh, there is a way for you to, to take it down. But I would just caution you, you always, I always feel like you have more bargaining power while the video is still up. Right. Once they take it down, then you yeah, kind of we'll, played your hand. Yeah. What are you going to say? Like, give me money now? Uh, your video is not even online. Right. Um, yeah. So, I mean, if they, as long as they're still happy, their video is still online, you might, you might be able to get something out of it. I don't know. We got a Twitter question for Mr. Griffin from Zoikno. He says, what lens have you been using these days? You know, the lens I actually have on my, right now I have it on my infrared camera, is the new Panasonic 8-18 to millimeter. Mm -hmm. This was a lens that uh, I didn't have until recently. I saw a lot of photographers on these projects I was shooting for Panasonic using it, and I was actually able to borrow it for one of the last ones I shot, and I really liked it, so I actually finally got my hands on one. Uh, so that's my favorite one right now. It actually could replace my favorite 12-35 to millimeter. Yeah, I was really surprised uh, the d stark difference between eight millimeters and twelve millimeters. Yeah. I mean, it's dramatically wider, yeah. and I mean, I've, especially for those landscapes, it just looked awesome. Yeah, especially for landscapes because I've always really liked wide-angle lenses. It's probably the reason I liked the twelve to thirty-five in the first place. Is the twelve is pretty wide, and I like the the twelve millimeter prime that I'm using right now. The uh, the f uh, it's an f1.4 lens that, that's what i use to shoot the podcast my shot sure I, I love that focal length but yeah for when you really want to go even wider for landscapes the eight millimeter is kind of amazing i really love the tip that um is it ben from the switzerland video yeah how he talked about using those extremely wide angle lenses and getting really interesting foreground stuff and the dramatic landscape behind it i mean yeah i think that was uh, a very helpful tip yeah and something well, and I just, felt is hard to do with the 12 millimeter, but seemed much easier on the 8. <laughs> well, yeah, we found that when we were in Zion National Park. We were shooting such large stuff. I mean, we're not often around, like, huge landscape like that, like giant yeah. rock formations. And it was like I was able to fit everything I wanted in the shot, and you were struggling a little bit with 12. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it was funny. That, that trip, I only brought... Like, I, I didn't need to accomplish very much visually. Uh, you know, normally when I go shoot a documentary, I have to bring a lot of different lenses. For this shoot, we were just playing around in Zion National Park. I only brought my 12-millimeter prime, so I'd have some low-light performance if I needed it. And I brought my 8-18 because uh, I, I knew I only wanted to shoot wide-angle stuff. Yep. But normally for, like... The Panasonic documentaries I was shooting, I would bring like six lenses. I would have, I would definitely have my 42.5 millimeter prime, uh, which is a beautiful lens, uh, a little bit too tight for the the kind of shots I normally like to get, but you know it's great for like a portrait shot. And I would bring, I think I'd even bring my uh, 35 and 100 around just in case I need to just really to zoom in. Just to be safe. Yeah. Yeah, I'm traveling this trip with the only the 12 to 35, and I think that's perfectly fine. Oh yeah. Yeah, I think if you only have one lens, that's the one to have. So speaking of your IR camera, we have a YouTube question from Pegleg Media. He says uh, he's a ghost hunter, shoots a lot of night vision. If he put an IR light on top of the converted GH4, would he have a night vision camera? I think I think so. Yes, I would say I yes. I think it would work. But 
he makes the right point that you have to put an IR light on top to make it a night vision camera. You can't exactly. just walk around with a an, an IR camera. It needs something to be uh, some source for that infrared light. Exactly. Which for me during the day is just the sun. The sun actually puts out a ton of infrared light, so it's fine. But yeah, at night you could just get an in, an IR lamp. Our final question today is two YouTube questions from B Nielsen. Uh, one, he was wondering if I showed an infrared time lapse last week, and mm-hmm. it had some slider movement to it. Do you remember how I shot that? Uh, would you call it a slider movement? It didn't really slide. Oh yeah, it didn't really. Um, I do have a slider uh, by Synetics, this company that makes this motorized slider for time lapses. But do you remember what which I did? You, how I screwed which up? Which we were gonna bring. Yeah, no, <laughs> I did bring it. The... I, I, I brought it all the way to the desert, <laughs> to, to the to the gate. Basically, I brought it on the plane, Zion National Park, drove it to Utah, yeah. but left the rails in the car. And yeah. then we were in the park before we realized that the rails were in the car. But you got very creative with uh, the motorized head that you had left that you did have with you. Yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't motorize the slider movement along the rails. Uh, that would have required a whole bunch of parts. All I had was the motor, but the motor itself can act like a panning motor. So I rigged it up. I actually had to use my Pedco Ultra Clamp. Shocker. <laughs> Because I couldn't get this thing mounted on the tripod uh, without at the angle that I wanted it. So I actually just ended up clamping it to my tripod at the angle that I needed it. And uh, I just attached the camera to the motor and let the motor spin. And so it can move the camera from right to left over a 10-minute period. Yeah, about 100 and... What did you do? 170 it's degrees? A, yeah, something like that, yeah. yeah. It's like it was the movement was so slow, it's imperceptible... To me, like it didn't look like it was moving, but when you speed it up, it it's a now, cool. Am I remembering that you shot a time lapse of you shooting that time lapse? Yes, I did because I wanted to actually see that movement happen. <laughs> so maybe you can share that in the video yeah. of this. <laughs> <laughs> so B Nielsen had a second question that uh, I didn't even really think about while we were at the park. He was wondering if we needed to get a release form to shoot at the park, like a permit or something. Oh. We did not. Okay, we didn't get one. Did we need one? <laughs> no, I don't think so. It's but uh, you know maybe it's up to some legal interpretation. I looked up the uh, on the National Park Service website when you need commercial filming permits. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. Would you call our use commercial? I mean, we have an advertiser on this podcast, and you probably just showed a clip of it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so yeah, maybe uh, maybe you could definitely interpret our our use as commercial. Um, and it does say all commercial filming activities taking place within a unit of the National Park System require a permit. Uh, but then it goes on to say that still photographers do not, uh, unless certain, unless unless we were bringing in like models and props and we were causing a big scene, still photography is fine. I think even if it is commercial. So were we filming or were we photographing? <laughs> we were definitely photographing. I mean, I but, did shoot yeah. a little bit of video, but. Mostly I mean, it was photographs, just many photographs. Well, now we're getting, if we're right. recording I, audio, we, we're just yeah, shooting. How do, you, how do you define the difference between photography and video? I'm shooting. I guess it's just I'm, a matter of frame rate. <laughs> <laughs> so if I'm shooting a time lapse and it's one photo every second, I think that's photography. I but would But then, agree. you know, yeah, then when I'm shooting 30 frames per second, <laughs> now I'm shooting video. Yeah. I mean, so I don't know, legal gray area, I think. But uh, sounds Sounds like we're probably okay, though. But I do generally think, like, the way this is worded, it kind of sounds like the reason you would need a permit is because you are causing a problem. You're getting in the way. I mean, I think that's often why you need a permit. Yeah, they're thinking of a big setup and things like that, yeah. But what we're doing is just like any still photographer, single tripod, pointed one direction. Yeah. Well, yours was pointed many directions because (laughs) of your fanciness, but... But yeah, I think especially for shooting documentary kind of stuff, there's always an argument for being lean and shooting like a home movie operator because then you're yeah. not going to get there into trouble and you're not causing problems. And Exactly. Yeah. Well, that is our questions for this week. Boom. Another one in the books, my friend. Yeah. And uh, happy U.S. Constitution Day to you. Yeah. 
Did you know it's U.S. Constitution Day? Is that the day that we're recording this or the day that we're putting this out? Uh, The day we're recording this. It's U.S. Constitution Day. I went to a park that normally costs $5 to get into, and it was free, and I got this, the U.S. Constitution and Fascinating Facts About It book for free. Wow. Would you like to know a fascinating fact about the Constitution? Okay. (laughs) You ready? Did you know that Thomas Jefferson did not sign the Constitution? He was in France during the convention. And I'll leave you with that. You're welcome. (laughs) Well, uh, thank you all so much for, for watching and listening. We'll see you next week. We'll see you next week. Thanks. And on this week's episode, we're sharing our tips for recording great voiceover tracks. Dig it. (laughs) Dig it. That's funny.